If you're a collector, pawn shops can be a gold mine of deals and rare finds. Even though you never know what you'll come across, there's always the possibility of stumbling upon a hidden gem. It's not uncommon for seemingly ordinary items to be worth a fortune, and the Pawn Stars have certainly made their fair share of profitable discoveries. With a keen eye and some negotiating skills, customers can also strike a good deal and walk away with a valuable collectible. And let's not forget, sometimes the Pawn Stars make a steal and turn a low-priced item into a profitable investment. Join us as we delve into the biggest steals on Pawn Stars. Huge Risk with a Mastodon Tusk A customer entered the store with a seemingly ordinary but rare item he thought Rick would want. Seeing how rare his item was, he hoped to make some huge cash off Rick. And that's the game played in pawn shops anyway. Regarding rare items, either the buyer or the seller would make a huge profit off the other. According to the customer, the object he brought into the shop was a mastodon tusk, which he said had been found by his great-grandfather on a dig in Florida 48 years ago. Rick acknowledged that it was the first time he had seen such an item and was unsure of its value. The customer claimed that the tusk was valuable, but Rick needed to determine its authenticity and appraise its worth. The American Mastodon became extinct 13,000 years ago. The Mastodon family diverged from other elephant-like relatives in Miocene times. American Mastodon was widespread across North America, from Alaska to Central Mexico. Other Mastodon species were widely distributed worldwide, and Mastodon fossil remains are locally common and well-preserved in Pliocene and Pleistocene age deposits. Complete or near-complete skeletons have been recovered, some even with preserved hair. The fact that the creatures went extinct thousands of years ago makes their parts extremely rare, and thus very valuable. Rick knew that getting his hands on an actual mastodon tusk would fetch him a fortune. The thing before him looks like a tusk and looks old. And if it was found in North America, it could be a mastodon tusk or a woolly mammoth tusk. Rick isn't sure. It was natural for Rick to be suspicious about something he was unsure of. He seemed willing to take the risk of buying something that may or may not pay him in the long run. His suspicion was further heightened when he suggested bringing in someone to ascertain the true nature of the item, and the seller refused, claiming that he had no time to spare. The seller was firm on his asking price of $800 despite not having any knowledge about the authenticity of the item. This only made Rick more cautious about the purchase, as the tusk could potentially be misidentified. Without any certainty about what it really was, Rick was reluctant to pay the asking price, especially if it turned out to be just a piece of burnt wood. As usual, seeing the impatience of the seller, Rick directly slashed the price in half since he was taking a big risk for something he didn't even know anything about, much less the rarity it might have. The seller became willing to compromise and decided to settle for $550. They later settled for $500. Rick had taken a big risk. He had only two choices anyway. He either took the risk or lost the item. He stood a chance of throwing his money in the drain if the tusk was worthless. Hopefully, after appraisal, it would be worth more than he paid for it. Unwilling to keep the tusk on the shelf without confirmation of its true nature, Rick called in his expert on fossils and artifacts, Thomas, who is usually the one to examine items brought in that were found underground. Rick wanted Thomas to determine the tusk's authenticity and possible value, so he could make an informed decision on whether to purchase it. Thomas was able to confirm instantly that the item was genuine fossil ivory and estimated its age to be between 1,000 and 10,000 years old. He also explained that the item was not related to an elephant and had Rick guess the animal it had come from. He revealed that it was actually a walrus tusk, much to Rick's surprise. Walruses have wrinkled brown and pink skin, long coarse whiskers, flat flippers, and lots of fat on their bodies to keep them warm in the cold Arctic water. They can slow down their heartbeat to withstand the chilly water temperatures and to help them stay underwater for as long as 10 minutes. 
Their long tusks are useful in many ways. They use them to pull their enormous bodies out of frigid waters and seem to walk on their tusks. They also use their tusks to break breathing holes into ice from below. Tusks are found in both males and females and grow throughout their lives. These tusks are canine teeth and can grow about three feet long. Their whiskers are very sensitive and help the walruses find their favorite meals, such as clams, way down on the deep dark ocean floor. Their whiskers are longest at the corners of their mouth. Thomas believed that Rick did well to have paid $500 because the price of a walrus tusk had shot up in the big market and the task at hand, being two to three pounds, would be worth around $1,200 to $1,500. It was close to being a bust, but Rick's haunch was right. The tusk was old and he had made good money from it, more than double the price he got it for. The huge brush he took had paid off. Legendary Kunzite. Davy, a regular face at the store, came bouncing in with a family heirloom he claimed had been in his family for generations. The heirloom was Kunzite, the best known variety of the mineral Spodomene. It's named after famed gemologist George Frederick Kunz, who was the first to identify it as a unique variety of Spodomene. The pale pink color of Kunzite is a result of the presence of trace amounts of manganese. San Diego County in California is a significant source of high quality Kunzite. The mineral was first discovered in 1902 in Santa Barbara, California, where it is found alongside other valuable gemstones, such as tourmaline. In addition to being a beautiful gemstone, Kunzite also contains the element lithium, which is used to manufacture batteries and treat bipolar disorder. Skeptical about where such a valuable piece of gem surfaced, Rick asked if it wasn't just a fancy piece of glass. But all David knew was that it had been in the family for a long time. Rick didn't trust that the gem was real, so he called his gemologist, Jeff, to check it out. Jeff was not used to seeing Kunzite, let alone one of that size. So he was pretty pumped to ascertain the genuineness of the gem by running some tests, which were just him looking at the gem through the lens of a microscope and measuring the light with a refracting index machine. From the tests conducted, Jeff confirmed that the gem was, as a matter of fact, a genuine Kunzite. Rick was already familiar with Davy and knew a huge negotiation was coming up. So he immediately asked Jeff how much he thought the Kunzite was worth. Jeff estimated it to be worth $30 to $50 a carat, and the entire Kunzite was about 323 point right carats, which brought the total worth to $9,600. As expected, Davy asked for $15,000 for the stone. After some bargaining, they agreed on a price of $6,500, a real bargain for Rick, as the item was said to be worth almost $9,600. Despite paying less than the gem's appraised value, Rick still felt that he had made a good deal, considering the rarity and beauty of the Kunzite. It is customary to see Pawn Stars helping customers dispose of junk by buying it. Some of this junk later turns out to be extremely valuable, causing them to make great cash. But what happens when the customers turn the tables around and make great cash off Pawn Stars? Huge profit off an ancient coin. Since Pawn Stars usually help customers dispose of their junk, they usually pay way lower than the asking price. But this time, things have changed. Sometimes, experts come up with super high appraisals that leave the buyers themselves wondering if they didn't make a mistake, and this is one of those times. A customer walked into the store and immediately told Rick that he was there to help him, instead of the usual way the Pawn Stars get to say that line. The customer came in with what he hoped was a very old and equally rare coin. He figured he'd come in to see if it was worth what he thought, which was, as a matter of fact, a substantial amount. Rick thought it was cool, but he still wanted to know how it came to be. Having researched the coin, the seller, Kevin, found that it was expensive, so he hoped to get about $20,000. The coin was purchased at an auction 30 years ago, and Kevin got it in a will. Rick was sure it was from the Eastern Mediterranean, but there were hundreds, if not thousands, of coins like that, some big and others small 
from Egypt, Greece, and Sicily. The small ones were pretty common, but the big ones were not so common. There and then, Rick estimated that the coin was worth anything between $1,000 and $10,000. But the problem was that there were 500 fakes for every real one. In other words, the fake ones were so bad that you'd have trouble finding the genuine ones. Never one to take an uncalculated risk, Rick decided to call in an expert to verify the coin. For some reason, Kevin believed it would be in his favor. He strongly believed that Rick would be pleasantly surprised. Rick waited to beat about the bush as soon as the expert came. He went straight to business, asking if the coin was real. The expert was first surprised upon seeing the coin. It turned out to be a decadrachm of Syracuse, among the most alluring coins of antiquity. Its artistry, designed by Kimon and Uinatos, has captivated coin lovers for two and a half millennia. Syracuse's decadrachm is considered one of the finest currencies ever discovered. The portrait of the nymph Arethusa is carved on the other side. The work of Uinetos, a Sicilian master engraver working in Syracuse at the end of the 5th century BC, has always captured people's imagination. As Euripides said, the beautiful will always be loved. The Decadrachm of Syracuse are exceptional coins in light of their weight and unit, and they were probably given away as prizes in the games held following the Athenian defeat in 413. The coin may be worth its weight, but it still had to be verified like any other item that entered the pawn shop. The expert looked at it through his spy glasses, sending Rick and Kevin into suspense. You could cut the atmosphere with a knife. After a while, the news came. It was genuine. It had great metal quality, and all the features lined up perfectly to form a genuine coin. It was good news for Kevin, but it would be even better for Rick, or maybe not. Realizing the nature of things, Rick immediately asked how much money was on the table. The expert was about to say something to either please one of them or completely shatter the other person's hopes. The amount the expert estimated was something neither Rick nor Steve saw coming. Somebody was about to get rich, but who? According to the expert, the coins could fetch a solid $50,000. A whopping $50,000 completely out of the expectations of Kevin, who had come to get $20,000. Rick was an expert negotiator. After all, he directly slashed the price to $35,000, already more than Kevin had initially requested. After a while, he offered $40,000. Any fan of Pawn Stars would know that once Rick sets his mind on a price, it's nearly impossible to change it. He maintained $40,000 until Kevin agreed to it. This was a steal. Someone made huge profits, but it wasn't Rick as usual. It was a customer. Instead of having his asking price slashed by half, he got double what he asked for. As we said earlier, the table had turned and the predator became the prey. Speaking of making a huge profit from Pawn Stars, Kevin wasn't the only one who got lucky. Some guy brought in a sword. You won't believe how much he got for it. Antique Russian Saber. A customer named Alex walked into the store carrying what looked like a rifle case. It immediately made Chumley guess that he had brought a rifle. But upon opening the case, Chumley was a little surprised to see that it was not a rifle, but a sword. Alex said he got the sword from his grandfather, who got it at an auction and gave it to him. He knew very little about the sword, only that it was old and would fetch thousands of dollars. Since he didn't have any real use for it, he thought his grandfather would mind if he used it for personal gain. At first glance, the sword looks amazing, with its gold and black sheath covered in amazing carvings and Russian inscriptions. Taking the blade out, Chum Lee immediately got confused. Russian writings were in the sheath, but the blade was inscribed in Arabic. Alex was hoping to get $40,000 for it. This wasn't something Chum Lee could just decide on especially with an asking price of that amount. 40000 seemed like a stretch to him, and according to Alex, even though he didn't know how much his grandfather had paid for it, 
At least he knew it was worth quite something. Chum Lee decided to call in someone who, hopefully, knew a lot more about the sword than Kevin did. Kevin wasn't bothered that an expert was coming. He was thrilled and was looking forward to learning the sword's true value and maybe some history. The expert stared at the word before touching it. You could guess that he respected it, maybe for whoever owned it. As to who owned it, the sword belonged to a Russian prince named Ivan Ivanovich Oduevsky, a hussar who was killed at the Battle of Brienne in France in January 1814 by Napoleon's troops. He was killed with his sword on him. He was a war hero, so his sword would be worth something significant. The sword is easily the most artistically and historically significant Imperial Russian sword to be offered in America since the September 1945 Gimbel sale of three Shashka from the Imperial collection at Tsarskoy Selo. The Odoevsky saber is similar to the magnificent swords awarded to British sailors and soldiers for distinguished actions during the Napoleonic Wars by the Patriotic Fund of Lloyds, except the Odoevsky saber is even more impressive. Chumley still wanted to know why the sword had Arabic writing on it. The Arabic writing showed that the sword was from Persia, which was not uncommon for the sword. It was built to be the head of state sword because it was made with the finest blade that could be put in it. It was not just a ceremonial sword, but an actual battle sword, despite its ceremonial features. Even the expert was left speechless by the sword since it is one of those things that you always hear about but never think you'll walk in and see. Things became more interesting when it came down to deciding the value of the sword. The expert said the sword sold at auction for $30,000, but he clarified that it was undersold because it was sold at the wrong auction house, which needed to know its value, and those who knew the value only knew it was there once it was sold out. If it were taken to an auction today and sold before the right buyers, the sword would sell for between $75,000 and $100,000. Chumley made a brutal offer to buy the sword for $20,000. According to him, knowing the actual value of the sword, he would like to offer $50,000 for it or even more. However, the little or not so little problem was that the sword had already been sold once in the open market, and it wasn't sold according to expectations, so it was like a dangerous territory for him to walk on. Alex had no intention of accepting $50,000 for the sword, especially not after what the expert said. Now that he knew the true value, he would rather take it to the right auction house and sell it at the right price. If he had decided to haggle with Chum Lee, there was a good chance he could have gotten $60,000 or more from him, which would have still been a steal. Considering that his asking price was $40,000, he could have gotten close to double. Speaking of double, would you believe a customer got more than four times her asking price? Yes, a painting suddenly went up leaps and bounds and Rick had to pay. Captain Bryaxi's Dream A lady came to Rick's counter with a painting she hoped to sell. It was a painting by Marc Chagall, a Belarusian-born French painter, printmaker, and designer who composed his images based on emotional and poetic associations rather than on rules of pictorial logic. Predating surrealism, his early works, such as I and the Village in 1911, were among modern art's first expressions of psychic reality. His works in various media include sets for plays and ballets, etchings illustrating the Bible, and stained glass windows. As usual, the print was valuable, so Rick wanted to know its source. According to the seller, she had a wealthy aunt who gave her the print, but it didn't fit in with the aesthetic of her room, so she wanted to sell it. There are countless artists worldwide, many of whom are famous. There's Picasso, Renoir, and the like. But unlike other artists, people will talk about Marc Chagall's work for centuries, and his paintings would still be worth the money. The seller wanted $1,000 for it and was unwilling to go any lower. Since she needed paperwork for it, Rick called it Chagall-esque. When Rick doesn't know something, he always knows someone who does. So he calls someone in to look at and decipher the complex life of art before him. The expert came in, 
he spent time identifying the work as one of Chagall's. Chagall discovered lithography when he was already famous, but he learned it from the absolute master Morlot. With his skills as a painter and as a colorist, Chagall changed the standard for all lithography. Lithography is a printing process that involves using a stone or metal block on which an image has been drawn with a thick substance that attracts ink. Captain Briaxi's dream is one of his most famous images. It was rumored that he slept on the floor of the printing shop while printing this particular work to ensure that his colors were not messed up because they were the key to Chagall's paintings and set him apart from other painters and colorists. This particular image is from Daphne and Chloe, a second century Greek poem put out in an illustrated book. Rick immediately moved to the big question, what was the print worth? According to the expert, if it were in a gallery in San Francisco or New York, it would be worth at least $8,000. Neither Rick nor the seller expected that the print would be worth that much, even though they already knew it would be quite valuable. She wouldn't accept $1,000 after hearing what the expert said about the print's value. Rick offered to pay $3,000, but she still thought it was too low and would settle for $6,000. After the usual back and forth haggling, they finally agreed to $4,500. And that was the problem with bringing in experts. If they come and do their job diligently, pawn stars usually pay more than the initial price. If you think about it, the deal was a steal for the seller. Her asking price was a thousand, but she got over four thousand. It's not like Rick was always on the losing end. What happened when he bought a piece of crap? Old rusted golf oil sign. While Rick was in Georgia, he bought something that Corey described as scrap metal, which he found at the back of an army surplus space. According to Rick, it was an absolutely fabulous find and he immediately shipped it to Rick's Dale to restore it. Corey could still not see beyond the obvious fact that it was simply an old, rusted sign. He had no idea how his dad expected to make a dime from it. Rick had bought the sign for $1,500 and paid an additional $1,200 to have it shipped from Georgia, and according to the repairman, he would pay another $10,000 to restore it. According to him, the sign itself was collectible, but for Rick to find the pole and the piece that held it up, it was worth its weight in gold. Corey still had no idea how such an old, rusted piece of crap could be worth anything, and he was yet to make peace with the fact that his dad had paid for such scrap metal. On the other hand, Rick still believed that he had found the Holy Grail. They left Rick's Dale to return later, and they were pleasantly surprised upon their return. Even Rick, who knew things would turn out great for him, was equally surprised, almost as surprised as Corey. On the other hand, Corey simply refused to accept that the same scrap metal he had seen had turned into a magnificent sign. He insisted that the repairman had simply gotten rid of the sign and got a new one. The surprise didn't stop at the fact that the piece of crap had turned into a brand new sign. When the price at which the sign could be sold was mentioned, Corey was stunned. Words could not describe the expression on his face. He thought his dad had made a mistake, but it turned out that Rick would get $25,000 for something he bought for $1,200. It was simply a steal for Rick, one of his best. Even the repairman was emphatic when he said that Rick simply stole it. When a bargain goes wrong, money is lost, and sometimes it involves tens of thousands of dollars. However, Rick Harrison and his crew have never stopped their job because of losses, as they have developed a thick skin to losses. You do not have to worry about losses with our happy Rick Tough Samsung cases out for sale. Do not miss this chance. Grab yours now by clicking on your screen or clicking on the first link in the description. What are your thoughts about these impressive bargains? Let us know in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. Remember to like and subscribe to see more.